terror, and death. American B-29s have embarked on a relentless bombing campaign designed to pound Japan into submission and put an end to World War II. The firestorm incinerates the city. Temperatures on the ground reach more than 1,800 degrees. The water in Tokyo's canals boils. The aftermath is horrific. By the war's end, more than 75% of Tokyo has been leveled. And more than one million people are left homeless. As American occupation forces enter the capital, they rush to seize documents to chronicle Japan's war activities. But most of the records have been destroyed in the bombings. The few sensitive papers that survive are burned in what becomes known as the bonfire of the bureaucrats. But strangely, there is one group of records that emerges from the ashes. 14 bound volumes of top secret cables and reports called Racial Problems and Related Miscellaneous Matters, Jewish Problem File. Some 8,000 pages dealing with Japan's relationship with the Jews in the 1930s and 40s. The quantity of paperwork is remarkable considering few realize the Japanese had any relationship with the Jews during this period. Buried deep within the papers is a cable dated July 28, 1940 from a Japanese consul in Lithuania to the foreign ministry in Japan. The diplomat sending the message is named Chiune Senpo Sugihara. He writes of his shock over the terror activities being targeted at the Jews. At the end of the letter is a startling revelation. Sugihara says there are hundreds of Jewish refugees outside his consulate gates every day, begging for transit visas to flee the country. Other correspondence indicates the foreign ministry will not authorize the writing of the visas. Sugihara continues to ask permission, but his requests are denied. More and more refugees gather outside, and Sugihara is clearly moved. There were women, and old people, and children. They all seemed exhausted. I didn't know whether they had any place to sleep. Maybe they slept in the train station or on the street. Each day, the crowd grew bigger. With tears in their eyes, they asked for the Japanese visas. Can Sugihara take the risk and issue the visas? How will his government react? Japan is soon to be Germany's ally. How will the Nazis react? Lithuania is Russian territory, and they are enslaving Jews in labor camps. How will they respond? But finally, there is another document, a list. More than 2,000 names of desperate Jewish refugees who are issued visas by Chiyune Sugihara. Life-saving documents that allow them to trace a little-known escape route through Russia into Japan. And due to Sugihara's courageous efforts, more than 40,000 people are alive today. There's no question that Sugihara was the savior of my life and of my family, of my children. The 37 people descendants are grateful to Sugihara for being in this world. I believe that he was a special person, a very remarkable human being. And to him, uh, human rights 
were very, very important. He believed that everybody should be able to be free. Junei Sugihara is the only Japanese citizen to be honored by the Israeli Holocaust Memorial, Yad Vashem, as righteous among the nations, a recognized rescuer of Jews. But this honor came late in the man's life, more than 45 years after his humanitarian deeds. Sugihara never asked to be acknowledged for what he did, and he never profited from his efforts. Why would he perform these courageous acts and ask for nothing in return? What were his motives? What influenced him? Was there a hidden agenda? Or was it simply an act of kindness? To best understand Sugihara, it is important to first try to understand Japan. Japan is a small island nation with few natural resources. Throughout its history, the country was a simple agricultural society with little contact with the outside world. However, by the late 1800s, the Industrial Revolution reached Japan, and soon the country needed more raw materials and more land. Japan set her sights on the vast, resource-rich Chinese territory of Manchuria and was willing to fight for it. In 1894, she launched a war with China and 10 years later fought the Russo-Japanese War against Russia. However, Japan needed an enormous amount of money to finance this ambitious war effort. In February of 1904, they dispatched a special finance minister, Korakio Takahashi, to the world's financial center in London to secure a war loan. But every banker turned him down. Why wouldn't they give him money? Because the Japanese were fighting the Russians. We knew the Russians. No one knew the Japanese. And everyone was convinced that the Japanese would lose the war. You don't lend money to the loser, he'll never pay it back. Then, in a chance meeting at a dinner party, Takahashi encountered an American named Jacob Schiff. Schiff was a prominent Wall Street financier and a Jew. Schiff says, what do they know? I'll give you all the money. Takahashi took it. And then he asked, tell me, why does everyone refuse me? and you give me all the funds. Schiff says, as a banker, everyone should refuse you. I'm also a banker, and I understand why I should refuse you. But I don't give you the money as a banker. I give you the money as a Jew. The Russians had an attack on Jews in the village of Kishinev. He says, we're at the start of the 20th century. This is going to be the century of peace and the century of enlightenment. How dare they? have a pogrom against the Jews. I'll give you all the money you need on one condition. Beat the hell out of the Russians. Schiff's loan is an astonishing figure for 1904. More than $190 million. The Japanese won the war and surprised the world. Schiff became a national hero in Japan. Wall Street then became the international financial market because that loan was floated in Wall Street rather than in London. Until this time, the Japanese had little contact with the Jews, but the Schiff loan led to an enduring perception of the exaggerated power of the Jewish people, a view that would influence Japanese policy for the next 40 years. Meanwhile, the rural Japanese village of Yaotsu remained virtually untouched by industrialization, war, and the intrigue of international finance. 
Here, local farmers and samurai held fast to the ancient traditions of the Bushido Code, duty, honor, dignity, and an unwavering loyalty to family and country. Fiona Sugihara was born here on January 1, 1900. His mother hailed from a long line of samurai, so his early years were influenced by the Bushido Code. In my humble experiences, I think Bushido can be characterized as brave, to live bravely as a human being. There's a term, Hagakure spirit in Japan. This means that samurai should find the spirit to die. It doesn't only mean that they should find beauty in dying, but also to live strongly. This is what my father taught me. I believe Chune Sugihara had a strong samurai spirit living deep within him. Sugihara was always a fine student and showed a gift for foreign languages. He was also fascinated with foreign cultures. He became an avid baseball player and fan. After high school, Sugihara's father pushed his son to become a doctor and ordered him to take a medical school entrance exam. But Chiyune's heart was elsewhere, and his courage to disobey authority was evident. We went to take the test. He didn't write any answer because he didn't want to go into that school. And he only wrote his name on the paper, and he came out, ate the lunchbox, and came back quietly to his home and kept quiet. But later, grandfather found that he flagged intentionally, so he got furious. In 1918, against his father's wishes, Chione enrolled at the progressive Waseda University in Tokyo. He wanted to study English literature. Sugihara's father refused to finance his son's education, so Chione worked at odd jobs to survive. Then in 1919, he spotted a newspaper ad looking for candidates to study for foreign service. All expenses paid. The entrance exam was intensely competitive, but he was awarded a scholarship to a Japanese diplomatic training school in China. Sugihara's destiny would now lead him to Manchuria. In 1919, the Japanese Foreign Ministry founded a school for Russian studies in Harbin, Manchuria. Sugihara was a top student there, quickly becoming an expert in Russian language and culture. He even married a Russian woman. He also learned important moral lessons from the school's founder, Shimpei Goto. Shinpei Goto would lecture us on the philosophy of the school. What he would say was to take care of others, not to be a burden to others, and not to ask for any reward. Those three were the spirit of our school. After graduation, Chiyune was immediately enlisted by the Japanese embassy in Harbin to gather intelligence about the Soviets. During this time, committees within the Japanese government studied the Jewish people. Could these powerful Jews be of value in their international expansion plans? Many of their conclusions were drawn from anti-Semitic literature they believed to be true. On September 18, 1931, 
the Japanese military seized control of all of Manchuria and established a Japanese puppet state called Manchuko. They installed former Chinese Emperor Pu Yi as the leader of the new nation. Japanese militarists believed if Japan was to become a great international power, they needed to continue conquering territory and colonizing these new possessions. However, there was another group who believed there was a different way to achieve their lofty national ambitions. These were the industrialists, especially Manchurian industrialists. They said, why build a military and waste all that money on guns and munitions and being hated and stabbed in the back and going to war? Isn't there another way? Yes, there is another way. Make a great product. Sell it. They will buy it from you whether they love you or hate you. And you'll become rich, you'll become strong, you'll become powerful and invincible. But, and the but is the killer, Everything made in Japan in 1920s and 1930s was junk. If you bought a pair of shoes made in Japan, if you wear it in the rain, it would dissolve. If you bought a shirt made in Japan, if you pulled a thread, the whole shirt would come apart. They said in their cabinet meetings, we never made a good pair of shoes. Meanwhile, in Europe, Hitler had come to power, and the persecution of the Jews began. Hitler's anti-Semitic goals were being achieved by ridding Germany of the Jewish people. Japan was puzzled by Hitler's approach. The Nazis had lost great minds like Albert Einstein and Sigmund Freud. The Japanese had another plan. Now, Jews in Europe there's anti-Semitism, there's hate of the Jews. The Japanese could not understand it. Jews are a talented people, an educated people, love the country they live in. Wherever they live, there's always a great deal of culture and economic success. And now Jews are running for their lives. We have a lot of room. We have Manchuria. And if we don't populate Manchuria, we're going to lose it. Jews are engineers. Jews are architects. Jews are designers. Jews know how to make clothing. With Jewish brains, with Jewish technology, with Jewish experience, and with a disciplined Japanese labor force, we could create a joint venture that is made in heaven. Men like Colonel Norohiro Yasue, Navy Captain Koroshige Inuzuka, and Yoshike Ayukawa, the founder of Nissan and Toshiba, devised top secret plans to give the Jews a homeland in Manchuko and then import as many as 300,000 Jewish refugees to develop the territory. These special committees continued to study the Jews, but the militarists remained in control. In 1932, they attacked the port of Shanghai and took over the city. They also sought to gain control of the entire Manchurian railroad system. Sugihara was called on to negotiate the purchase of the northern portion of the railroad from the Russians. He was the perfect choice for the critical mission. In addition to his Russian skills, he had also gained inside information about the railroad from the local residents. He helped the Chinese and Korean farmers when they had a really bad flood. Later, they were working on the railroad as a labor. So when they heard that Chiune was negotiating with the Russia, they said, we want to help you. And they became his volunteer and start giving him all the information about this railroad. He, with his Chinese spies, basically were able to go around and find out the true value of the, of the Northern Manchurian Railroad, which the Russians had valued much higher. Because of his intelligence gathering information, he offered them half as much as they had wanted. And as a result, he paid a fair market value for the Northern Manchurian Railroad, which infuriated the Russians. 
But despite his rising stock within the foreign ministry, Sugihara would soon leave his post in Manchuria. He was the deputy foreign minister in the Manchurian government, which was an extremely repressive um, occupation of China, where tens of thousands, if not millions, of Chinese were murdered by the Japanese military occupying government. I resigned from my post in the foreign ministry of Manchukuo because the Japanese dealt with the Chinese cruelly. They didn't consider them human. I couldn't bear that. In 1934, Sugihara divorced his Russian wife and returned to Japan. Surprisingly, he was not reprimanded for his stance in Manchuria. The foreign ministry had important plans for a diplomat with Sugihara's talents. persecution of the Jews was escalating rapidly. Many wanted to flee. But in July of 1938, 32 Western nations met in Evian, France, and determined that their borders would be closed to the Jewish people. Then in December, Japanese leaders gathered to clarify their policy toward Jewish refugees. The meeting was known as the Five Ministers' Conference. At the Five Ministers' Conference, they expressed in writing a policy that was a very simple statement, basically said that we do not want to alienate the United States, nor do we want to alienate Germany. We will treat Jews according to the existing laws of immigration as we treat all foreigners. But for those who may be of utility value to Japan, we will be especially receptive. The pro-Jewish faction in the Japanese government used the ambiguous policy to support their goals of establishing a Jewish state in China. They sent an emissary, Kozo Tomura, to the United States to make a proposal to the influential rabbi, Dr. Stephen S. Wise, president of the American Jewish Congress. And so Mr. Tamura comes to America and meets Rabbi Wise and meets him in his office. What did he offer him? We would be willing to take the Jews of Europe without passport, without visa, without money, without ransom, and without a trick. Just come. This is what Mr. Tamura presented to Rabbi Stephen Wise. I remember speaking to Mr. Tamura and he remembered that meeting very vividly. And uh, Dr. Weiss seemed very tall to him and overbearing and placed his arms around him, pressing down his shoulders and led him to the door and threw him out politely, but threw him out of his office. The question one asks is, why did Rabbi Weiss miss this opportunity to save so many Jews of Europe? You have to understand Rabbi Weiss at his time it's unfair to be the Monday morning quarterback after the Sunday football game. Rabbi Wise believed with a prophetic faith that if things become worse in Europe, if things become unbearable in Europe, Roosevelt, who was a gentleman, will open America to Jews, and England, which is Christian, will open Palestine to Jews. In addition, Rabbi Wise felt that he had no leverage in Japan. He had no influence in Japan. What if Jews would come to Japan and tomorrow the Japanese would line up against the wall and shoot them? What could he do? He couldn't protect them. He had no influence with them. And so Rabbi Wise declined that offer. But of course, Roosevelt never opened American shores. And Churchill didn't open Palestine. In the summer of 1940, Rabbi Wise changed his mind and wrote a letter to Japan which said, any offer to settle Jewish refugees in Japan which would come from authoritative sources in Japan 
would certainly receive the fullest consideration of Jewish organizations. However, by that time, it was too late. The Japanese military government had gained absolute control, and any plans for the refugee settlement in Manchuria were scrapped. During these years, Sugihara was back in Japan training for service in Europe, honing his skills as a diplomat and intelligence gatherer. In Tokyo, he met a beautiful young woman named Yukiko Kikuchi. She was immediately impressed by this worldly, sophisticated man. I noticed that he had very kind eyes, and he was unlike other Japanese men, especially in his attitude towards women. Back then, women were considered a lower class, but he would talk to me like I was his equal. Yukiko yearned to travel and was perfectly suited to be a diplomat's wife. After a brief courtship, the couple were married, and in 1936, their first son, Hiroki, was born. Soon, Chiyune received his dream assignment, a post in Moscow. But the Russians refused to allow him to enter the country. They still held a grudge from the Manchurian railroad negotiation. The manager of personnel department in Moscow was a diplomat who negotiated with Chiyune Sugihara at the table of Northern Manchurian Purchase and his name is Kazrovsky. So apparently he refused Chiyune Sugihara because he really didn't like him because of his knowledge and his ability. Instead, Sugihara would be dispatched to outposts surrounding the Soviet Union where he could observe the Russians. In 1937, the Sugihara family, as well as Yukiko's sister, were all sent to the embassy in Helsinki, Finland. On September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland and World War II began. Two weeks later, Russia attacked Poland from the east. Polish Jews were trapped between the terror of the two invaders, and many fled to the neighboring free nation of Lithuania. More than 20,000 Jews, including several yeshivas, Jewish academies, escaped across the border. The homeless refugees were supported by a large Lithuanian Jewish population that numbered more than 250,000. Lithuanian Jews invited the refugees into their homes and began hearing first-hand accounts of the atrocities in Poland. Sali Ganor was an 11-year-old boy living in the capital of Kaunas, Lithuania. Refugees came and began to hear the horror stories. As soon as they came, they started running around the embassies and uh, various consulates trying to get visas because they were absolutely sure that Lithuania will, won't be spared and will be next on the list. Susan Blumen and her husband were staying in a small Lithuanian farm town, but they desperately pursued a visa to a safe haven. And we were going very often to Kaunas, where all the consulate and embassies were located hoping that through them we'll be able to find a place of refuge. But was not the case, because it doesn't matter how many times we put our application, we were always denied. Nobody wanted us. We were just in a hopeless situation with no one. No one wanted us. In the fall of 1939, June Sugihara was reassigned to open a one-man consulate in the city of Kaunas, Lithuania. He was plunged into the center of the turmoil, and his mission of diplomacy and intelligence gathering 
would soon become a mission of mercy. In November of 1939, Sugihara arrived in Kaunas, Lithuania and set up consulate offices. He and his growing family lived upstairs in the building. There seemed to be little need for Japan to open a diplomatic office in Kaunas, where no Japanese people lived. It was obvious to me why the staff had insisted that the foreign office open a consulate in Kaunas, where there was no Japanese colony. I understood that my main task was to inform the general staff and the foreign ministry about the concentration of German troops near the border. They wanted to know whether the German army would really attack the Soviet Union. If the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union, Russian troops would be rushed to the German front. Then Japan would not have to guard the Manchukuo border as carefully freeing up their own soldiers for further expansion in Asia. Sugihara was the perfect choice for this position. He was fluent in Russian and German. He and his family would often venture out on picnics, conveniently choosing spots with excellent views of the surrounding landscape. We used to go to picnic very often on the weekends. And we used to go to very different uh, places that nobody goes. While we were playing, he used to disappear suddenly. We, even we didn't notice when he disappeared and didn't come back for two or three hours. Later, we found out that he was uh, going to the border of uh, German territory or Russian territory. Looking back at Sugihara's activities in Kaunas, the obvious question arises, was Sugihara actually a spy? Diplomats in times of peace are gathering information. In times of war, they're gathering intelligence. The difference between intelligence and information could be a fine line. He was involved with intelligence, that is clear. But was he a spy, a cloak and dagger spy? I don't think that's the case. December of 1939 was Hanukkah time. Sali Ganor, like many Jewish children, decided to give the money he received as holiday gifts to the suffering refugees. But when the new Laurel and Hardy movie came to town, Sali had second thoughts. He went to his aunt's gourmet shop to ask for money to see the film. Inside the shop, he saw Chione Sugihara. I turned around, and uh, that was the first time I saw a Japanese person. And he looked kind of strange. i never seen a person with slanted eyes. And he kind of smiled at me. Yeah, I felt very comfortable with him. There was a certain aura of, of kindness about him. I don't know how to explain. You know, as a child, I guess you, have, you feel these things more. Sally explained his financial dilemma to his aunt. But to his surprise, it was Sugihara who offered him the money. He sort of laughed, he smiled at me, and he, he took out a coin and he said, take it, take it. I said, I actually can't take money from uh, strangers, you know, not from family. And he said, no, so I'll be your uncle. Consider me your uncle, he said, uh, for this holiday. So that took me by surprise. So I took it, then it just came to me. I said, well, if you're my uncle, why don't you come to our Hanukkah party on Saturday? It was an outrageous invitation from an 11-year-old boy. But surprisingly, that Saturday night, Sugihara's family arrived at the celebration. And Sally's family was shocked. And everybody went, <gasps> <laughs> now what, you know, who are these people? So it was quite an event. But after the awkward beginning, 
it became a memorable evening for the Ganors and the Sugiharas. He, he remarked, I remember, to my, my mother, I mean, with a nice warm atmosphere in, our, in, in the house. And, and my uncle played a harmonica, so and everybody sang the songs. In Japanese homes, we don't talk much over meals. The Hanukkah party was unlike Japan, as the adults and the children were all having fun talking to each other quite cheerfully. Also, the Jewish food was very unusual for me. And it was a lot of food. I couldn't eat it all, and I didn't want to be rude. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> then, as the party wore on, Abe Rosenblatt, a Polish refugee who was staying with the Ganors, told Sugihara about his grim experiences fleeing from Warsaw. And he told everybody, and he broke down crying. And I noticed that uh, Sugihara was listening very carefully. I believe that he I genuinely I felt sorry for him. And he probably knew more than we did of what was taking place in, 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 in Germany. I think it definitely uh, had an emotional impact. the pressure intensified for the Polish refugees. Russian troops marched in and annexed Lithuania. This was no longer a free country. It was now part of the Soviet Union. The Russians ordered all foreign consulates to close. The options for escape were diminishing. Overnight, Jewish leaders were arrested. Yeshivas and synagogues were closed. Back in Poland, atrocities were increasing, and more Jews were crammed into ghettos. Heinrich Himmler, head of Hitler's SS, declared, the conditions in which these people live are a matter of complete indifference to us. They interest me only to the extent that we need them as slaves for our culture. The jaws of persecution were closing on the Jewish people. They were once again trapped between the onrushing Germans and the unpredictable Russians. It must be clearly understood that escape from Lithuania required far more than an act of kindness from a single man. Freedom for the refugees demanded a complex chain of creative maneuvers by a large cast of brave individuals. It also required a measure of good luck, events that some consider miracles. First of all, the Jewish refugees needed to secure a series of official documents and diplomatic stamps in order to leave Lithuania. Number one was a passport. Many people fled from Poland without this document, but some were able to secure a reasonable replacement from foreign embassies. Next, they needed an end or entry visa proof that another nation would accept them. These were extremely rare and becoming more difficult to obtain. If they managed to get an end visa, they also needed a transit visa, allowing them to land in another country while awaiting transportation to their final destination. Finally, they needed an exit visa, 
allowing them to leave Russian territory. This was impossible without securing the other documents first. Even if all this paperwork could be obtained, passage was now impossible through the battlefields of Western Europe. So the escape route had to be to the east, all the way across Russia, then to Japan to catch another ship from there. Many leaders of the Jewish community recommended that their people just stay put. They knew that often a request to leave Russia resulted in a sentence to a Siberian slave labor camp. The college of rabbis were against it because they said there is a Hebrew word, chef va'altase, sit, be quiet. Let's wait out the war here. Let's not antagonize the Russians. However, there were others that believed that remaining in Lithuania was simply a death sentence. Zorach Vorhaftig was a Polish refugee and leader of a Zionist movement in Lithuania. He worked tirelessly to free as many Jewish refugees as possible. He came from Warsaw to see what he could do, what was his basic motive for all these things, is the saving of souls of people. Not so much in a religious sense, but in a physical sense. Vorhaftig encouraged the Jewish people to get any end visa they could. The destination was unimportant. My regular advice to the refugees was that each was obliged to make the maximum effort to acquire an end visa. Even if there was no chance of procuring a transit visa in the immediate future, it might still be possible that those with an end visa would at some point be able to leave the Soviet Union. But the refugees had to move quickly. The Russians were shutting down all the foreign offices in Lithuania. Within weeks, there would be nowhere left to even request a visa, and escape would be impossible. At this point, several Dutch citizens stepped forward as unlikely heroes. Pesla Lewin was a Dutch Jew married to a Polish scholar. She and her family were living in Kaunas. Nathan Gutworth was also from Holland, and he was studying at the Tells Yeshiva in Lithuania. As Jews, Lewin and Gutworth feared for their lives and wanted to flee immediately. But they knew they could not return to their homeland. Holland was now occupied by the Nazis. In early July, they wrote to the Dutch ambassador in Riga, Latvia, named L.P.J. de Decker, with an unusual request. They asked for an end visa to the island of Curaçao, a tiny Dutch possession near the United States. My choice was Curaçao because my future wife had a sister in America. So she wanted to be near her sister, so we decided to go so. De Decker's reply was encouraging. He wrote that it was not necessary to acquire any visa to enter Curaçao. However, it was necessary to first have permission of the island's governor. Although it was virtually impossible to obtain the governor's permission, perhaps a small window was opened. Gutworth wrote back, asking if the same option was available for about 20 of his schoolmates who were not Dutch citizens. The reply was the same. No visa was needed, but it required permission of the governor. The question now was if De Decker would perform a courageous favor. Would he be willing to write on their passports, it is not necessary to have a visa to enter Curaçao, 
but then leave off the critical words that said, but those entering must have the permission of the governor. Incredibly, De Decker agreed. So it's a legal nicety that is sort of performed. It's a little trick that, that technically is true, although it's missing an important part of information. So we have a little charade going on here that's involving this tiny little island. But this was sufficient to stand as a entry visa for refugee Jews. Somehow he agreed to it. That's one of the strange happenings in history, which changed history for uh, thousands of people. Why did he do it? Because I'm surprised myself. But maybe he just did it because he was a good man. Step one was complete. The next hurdle was getting a transit visa through Japan. Goodworth took his Kurosawa visa to the Japanese consulate and Chiune Sugihara. I came in and he received me very politely and I said, well, I'm going to Curaçao, that he saw my passport, and he saw I was a Dutch citizen, so he was very friendly, and uh, I had no trouble. I think in 10, 15 minutes, I was out. At this point, there was no reason for Sugihara to doubt the authenticity of Gutwurt's papers, and he gladly issued the transit visa. Lewin and her family, like Gutworth, also received their transit visas from Sugihara. These Dutch Jews now had two key elements for escape, an end visa and a transit visa. Now, the plot thickens. Zorach Vorhaftig heard of Gutworth and Lewin's success and reacted quickly. He recognized the significance of the Curaçao visa, this could be the ticket to escape. Vorhaftig asked Gutworth to approach the newly appointed Dutch consul in Kaunas, named Jan Zwartendijk. Would Zwartendijk also be willing to stamp Jewish passports with the same Curaçao information? And would he do it for large numbers of refugees? Zwartendijk was not a professional diplomat. He was an officer of the Philips Electronics Company, filling in as consul during these final days in Kaunas. He conferred with De Decker. Should he take this risk? Then, in another heroic act of kindness, Zwartendijk agreed to issue these Curaçao visas to everyone. He accepted, and basically, he was only consul for a very, very short time. But in this short time, he saved thousands of people. Then, thanks to Vorhoftig, word of this possible escape plan spread like wildfire. I launched a frantic campaign to publicize this mythical document among the refugees. And as a result, induced thousands to apply for this phantom visa which subsequently proved to be their salvation. Over the next nine days, Jans Wartendijk issued over 2,300 Curaçao visas, including 300 to the entire Mir Yeshiva. Few refugees knew exactly where Curaçao was, and they had no intention of actually going there. But at this point, any visa would do. However, these Curaçao visas were completely useless, unless these thousands of refugees could also get the Japanese transit visa from Chiyune Sugihara. July 1940. 
Sugihara was preparing to close his consulate and report to the Japanese embassy in Berlin for reassignment. He believed his work in Kaunas was over. He had no idea he was about to face a moral test that would change his life forever. I opened my bedroom window in the morning, and there they were, about 200 of them, I guess, surrounding the house. We had no idea who they were. A crowd of Jewish refugees with Curaçao visas was outside begging to see the Japanese consul, and the desperate mob was becoming unruly. There were children, women, and young men. They were all hanging on to the fence. The young men were trying to climb over the fence, but the security of the consulate was pushing them back. Sugihara asked the crowd to send in five representatives to state their case. Zorach Vorhaftig led the group, and Samuel Graudens was his assistant. Inside, the men requested transit visas and told Sugihara that he was their last hope. We discussed the matters with him, and he had his, uh, at first, his doubts whether he can do it, because he would have to get the permission of his government. They explained what had happened in their hometowns with the Germans. Poland had been bombed and occupied. I wanted to issue the visas, but I didn't know how I was going to do it. I had to wire the home office for instructions. Sugihara cabled back to the foreign ministry in Tokyo. In his letter, he described the mounting problems in Kaunas and asked permission to issue the visas. But the response was negative. Visas could only be issued if Sugihara followed strict guidelines. The refugees must have a valid end visa, and they must have enough money to cover their travel expenses. It was now obvious to Sugihara that these Curaçao visas were useless, and the refugees had no money. Clearly, issuing visas for this mass of refugees would be a flagrant violation of the rules. Over the next few days, Sugihara cabled back several times with visa requests. But the approval never came. Meanwhile, the crowds continued to build outside the consulate. I wasn't frightened by the crowd. They all looked so sad. Some women were looking right at me with great sorrow. Some of them had their hands together begging. I could see how they came there, depending on us. Sugihara was faced with an agonizing decision. To disobey his government would surely bring punishment and disgrace. And of course, assisting Jews in these anti-Semitic times could lead to grave consequences. To the Soviets, emigrants were considered traitors. Aiding their passage was a capital offense. And also, Japan's future allies, the Nazis, were now closing in on Lithuania. If we were in Germany and we did something like that, my husband, myself, my children could all be taken away by the Nazis. I didn't know what they would do to us. Maybe they'd kill us. At this point, Perhaps Sugihara reflected on those moral lessons from his past. 
or the warm relationships he had forged. And maybe he considered Japanese policies that were favorable towards the Jews. He might have thought about the edicts of the Five Ministers Conference. Or perhaps he looked into the eyes of his own children. Those people told me the kind of horror they would have to face if they didn't get away from the Nazis. And I believed them. There was no place else for them to go. They trusted me. If I had waited any longer, even if permission came, it might have been too late. Finally, in early August 1940, Chione Sugihara agreed to write the transit visas. I may have disobeyed my government, but if I didn't, I would be disobeying God. The crowds of hopeful refugees arrived in droves. For the next four weeks, Sugihara worked tirelessly to fulfill their requests, issuing hundreds of transit visas a day. Many had to be handwritten in complex Japanese characters. At first, he carefully checked the refugees' paperwork, but soon everyone was receiving visas. I'd say more than half of them had no passport. Under the conditions they had to deal with when they left their homeland, it seemed understandable. So we accepted anything, even blank sheets of paper with Curaçao, no visa required, handwritten as a destination. Some refugees, like Benjamin Fischoff, Susan Blumen and her husband, had no Curaçao visas at all but still received their Sugihara visa. My husband went to Chuni uh, Sugihara asking for a visa, but we didn't have any other visa on it, really. But somehow Sugihara gave us the visa. He was just doing from the bottom of his heart. It was wonderful. Sugihara churned out visa after visa working more than 16 hours every day until he was exhausted. He became obsessed with his mission. He even requested an extension on his stay in Kaunas so he could continue his life-saving work. Moses Zupnik came to Sugihara requesting 300 visas for the entire Mir Yeshiva. I came in, I was all excited. And uh, he, I saw that he measured me. He was sitting at his desk and measuring me from top to the bottom, of who I am, what I am. I said to him, I'm a representative of the Mira Yeshiva. We want to go to Curaçao. We just want to go to Japan. Zupnik nervously awaited the response. To his surprise, Sugihara agreed to write all 300 transit visas. I still remember when he looked at me, when he said to me, all right, I give you the visas. He, he, I don't forget those things because he's still, uh, he's still all alive in me. He saw people suffering and he thought maybe he could help, and he helped. Zupnik returned several days later to pick up the visas. But he found Sugihara's assistant, Wolfgang Gucha, in a panic over the ever-growing volume of requests. So I came in the morning, I see Wolfgang Gutsch is all excited and tells the consul, how could I handle a thousand visas? The people are standing outside in line, how could I all handle it? I heard it, so I said to Gucci, you know what, I will help you. He went over to Shigahara and said, he wants to help me. He looked at me, let him help you. For the next two weeks, Zupnik sat with Gucha, stamping passports for Sugihara.
But finally in late August, the Russians insisted that the Japanese consulate close. Sugihara and his family packed up to leave Kaunas, while Moses Zupnik prepared for his journey to Japan. Wolfgang Gucha was of German descent, so he headed to Germany to reluctantly join Hitler's army. When I left the consul, it was very interesting, and I said, Wolfgang, how could I thank you? He, he parted with me with those words, which I still remember. You don't have to thank me, but the world is a wheel, in German called ein Rad. I mean, a wheel, you know what a wheel is, uh, yeah, a wheel. Today Hitler is on top, tomorrow he might be down. Don't forget what I did for you. But Wolfgang Gucha was never heard from again. Despite Sugihara's heroic efforts, he could not help everyone. As he was driving away from the consulate, Nadia Kaplan and her family arrived. Her two children were traveling on her husband's passport, but she had no passport of her own. My husband stopped the car. He was standing in front of the car and stopped it. And Mr. Sugahara opened the window and says, what, what is it? You know, in German. So my husband just showed him the passport. He took the passport, stamped it, looks at me, and I said, I don't have a passport. So he said like this, and he went. There was nothing Sugihara could do. Nadia had no way out but at least her family would be saved. I felt that I, I wanted to save the children. The children have to get out. I shouldn't cry, I should smile. It's very hard. Then you think back, you know, I said, I'm not going to come home. After writing more than 2,000 transit visas, Sugihara prepared to leave for Berlin. He was so exhausted, like a sick person. Even though he was ordered to go to Berlin, he said he couldn't make it to Berlin and suggested we go to a hotel and rest before leaving. When we got to the hotel, the Jewish people came looking for us there. So he wrote some more visas in the hotel. The next day, when we got to the train station, they were there too. So he wrote more visas on the platform until the train left. Once we were on board, they were hanging on the windows and he wrote some more. When the train started moving, he couldn't write any more. Everyone was waving their hands. One of them called out, Thank you, Mr. Sugihara. We will come to see you again. And he came running after the train. I couldn't stop crying. When I think about it, even now, I can't help crying. refugees now faced the most treacherous part of their quest, approaching the Russians for an exit visa from the Soviet Union. Most of us thought, once we make the application to go out of Russia, we are, we are putting our life in danger. Most people were warning us, telling us not to do that. To acquire the exit visa, application had to be made to the Soviet government travel bureau, called Intourist. The office was staffed by officers of the NKVD, the forerunner of the KGB. The interrogation was brutal. 
but incredibly, the Russians agreed to issue the paperwork. The one catch was, the fee for a train ticket out was exorbitant. That was a very serious problem, because the Russians gave you permission to travel through Russia, but you had to pay in dollars, in US dollars. It was $180, which included also the fee for the boat going from Vladivostok, Russia, to Japan. But who had $180 at the time was a fortune of money. Many refugees received financial aid from international Jewish relief organizations such as the Joint Distribution Committee, the JDC. However, others had to rely on their wits to find their way onto the train. I got my ticket, I was lucky, I had a good violin. And a Russian soldier saw the violin, started playing it on, on the street, and he said, oh, what do you want with that violin? That's my biggest miracle, because the violin saved my life. What do you want for your violin? I said, I'll tell you what I want. Buy me a ticket on the next railroad, the next train that goes to Vladivostok. I got my ticket. That saved my life. Why were the Russians willing to let the Jews leave? Was it only for the money? It appears that Sugihara interceded on the refugees' behalf with friends in the Soviet government. Some believe the Russians used the mass of refugees to sneak spies into foreign countries. But the refugees weren't asking any questions. They were on the train to freedom. who managed to board the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Freedom was still a long way off. They now needed to endure an arduous journey some 3,000 miles across Russia to the port of Vladivostok. The 11-day trip would take them through the heart of Siberia and the hard labor camps where many of their fellow refugees were enslaved. Of course, it was very dangerous. Whenever the, car, the, the train would stop and we saw the police outside, we were very worried security shouldn't come out and take us right down. Eventually, the refugees reached Vladivostok and boarded small ships to transport them to the unknown island of Japan. I didn't even know where Japan was, except we knew it. More or less, it was in Asia. But exactly what kind of people and uh, what kind of life that the Japanese were leading and then what kind of, whether it was industrial country or not, we had no idea the beautiful and wonderful life that the Japanese were leading at the time. So we had no idea where we were going to. Meanwhile, the small Jewish community in Kobe, Japan, formed a committee called JUCON, to find food, housing, and money for the sudden rush of homeless refugees. Leo Hannon was a member of the group. We gave everybody at that time one yen, 10 cents, which was like 30 cents in American money a day. They would come, line up, give them, and they, they, if a family of three or four could buy whatever they needed. The stores were open, everything was around. But as the refugees poured in, money became a problem, and JUCOM sought the help of the Joint Distribution Committee in New York. Prior to the arrivals of larger groups, we, we were all well-to-do, but not, we knew we couldn't, couldn't uh, finance the whole thing. There were so many people. So we sent a telegram to New York, to the Joint Distribution, and the reply came back, as long as I live, I'll never forget it, money, no object, save Jews. 
When we arrived in Japan, the Jewish community was waiting for us, and all these um, several hundred people went down, and uh, they were received by a committee, and everything was, of course, extremely joyful and happy. We looked at Japan the first time in our lives. We saw the people carrying oranges, bananas, and apples, and we haven't seen this for, for God knows how long. The sun was shining, and we just, we felt we were reborn again. The refugees were received warmly by the Japanese citizens. These Jews had found their way to paradise, but their elation was tempered by thoughts of those they left behind. In Poland, three million Jews were murdered by the Nazis, eliminating more than 90% of the Jewish population. In June of 1941, the Germans invaded Lithuania and the Soviet Union. Many Lithuanians were grateful to be freed from Soviet rule. Before long, Lithuanian Jews were being slaughtered not only by the Germans, but by Nazi sympathizers. Right after Sugihara had left and the Soviets had vacated, when the Nazis came in, seeing the Lithuanian citizenry were killing Jews by the hundreds, killing them in great massacres, beating them to death with axe handles and axes, murdering them in the streets. So the Nazis never saw such willing collaborators anywhere, including Poland, as they did in, in Lithuania. Those who didn't get Sugihara visas had a tiny, tiny chance to survive. Lithuanian Jews were now considered Soviet citizens and were not permitted to leave the country, even if they secured the proper paperwork. Sali Ganor received a Sugihara visa but he and other Jewish residents of Kaunas were now trapped. 30,000 Jews were placed in a ghetto, supposedly for their own protection. So the Germans said, well, you see, the Lithuanians don't like you. And uh, to protect you from them, we will put you in a ghetto. And so in a way, we were kind of happy to get out. But soon we found out what the Germans intended to do with us. Some of the most horrific atrocities took place at an old fortress above the city of Kaunas called the Ninth Fort. In the end of October and 41, they collected the whole ghetto with about 30,000 people and they sorted 10,000 out. And next day, they marched them out to the ninth for the whole 10,000. And we heard there was about maybe, what, uh, 10 miles away above on the hills. And we could hear the, the machine guns going day and night. Could hear them being killed. Lithuania's Jewish population once numbered over 250,000. By the war's end, less than 3,000 were alive. after Sugihara left Kaunas, the Japanese signed the Tripartite Pact, a formal alliance with Germany and Italy. But Foreign Minister Matsuoka quickly reassured the Jewish communities of Japan and China that they would not be persecuted by the Japanese. Matsuoka said, anti-Semitism will never be adopted by Japan. True, I concluded a treaty with Hitler, but I never promised to be an anti-Semite.
Sugihara and his family were now in Berlin, awaiting reassignment. The extent of his deeds was not yet known. Chiune and Yukiko worried about possible punishment. But fortunately, they were quickly transferred to Czechoslovakia and hoped the incident would be forgotten. By the winter of 1941, the flood of Polish refugees was landing in Japan. Although their transit visas were valid for just two weeks, few were leaving the country. Matsuoka wrote to Sugihara in Prague for a complete report of his visa writing. For the first time, Sugihara submitted his list to the foreign ministry. 2,139 names. But these weren't all the refugees. Many families traveled on a single visa, and forgeries of Sugihara's government stamp were created after he left Kaunas. By March of 41, there's a huge problem in Japan with people who just don't have any place to go, and these are people who receive visas from Sugihara. There's no question of that. At this point, there were still no reprimands or punishments for Chiyune's activities. In fact, a document in the Jewish problem file indicates he wrote 69 more unauthorized transit visas in Prague. Back in Japan, pressure mounted on the Japanese to adopt Hitler's anti-Semitic policies. It was not very pleasant to see those articles in the newspapers. And then they started to make exhibitions. I went to one of those exhibitions in the Sogo department store in Kobe. And uh, very disquieting because they had a big globe over there. And around the globe, it was all in Japanese except, and a snake around the globe. And the snake had a six, and we're going to with a six uh, and star, Jewish star. And then, where it was New York, the N was crossed over, a J was put there, New York. That's the only thing that was in English that I saw. The rest was in old Japanese pictures of all kinds. I, I was disgusted I left. In the spring of 1941, the government in Tokyo called for leaders of the Jewish community in Kobe to report to the capital immediately. They needed information about the Jewish people. Leo Hannon accompanied rabbis Kalish, Shapiro, and Shotskis to the tense meeting with several military officers. I was sitting there without a smile. That, that made me very nervous. Main question is why do our allies, the Germans, hate the Jews so much? Rabbi Kalish offered an eloquent and pointed explanation. He said, gentlemen, the Nazis hate the Jews because the Nazis know that we Jews are Asians. They listen to that and were stunned. They say, what do you mean you Jews are Asians? We are Asians. He said, you're also on the list. He said, what list are you talking about? He says, young man, why don't you read? Why don't you listen to what they say in Europe instead of the censored translation they give you here? You know what they talk about in Europe? The Aryan. The pure race, six foot tall, not one Japanese. Blonde hair, not one Japanese. Blue eyes, not one Japanese. Caucasian skin, not one Japanese. He said, you're not the Aryan. You're not the pure race. They talk about the Jews. They talk about the gypsies. They talk about the Slavs. They talk about the blacks. They talk about the yellow. Who's the yellow? That's you. When they finish with us, they come to you. We're from one side of Asia, called Israel. You're from the other side of Asia, called Japan. But we're in the same boat. After a long deliberation, the Japanese leaders announced their conclusion. The top man says, go home, back to Kobe, and tell your people not to worry. We will not do to you what the Germans are doing. That was very good to hear. After Pearl Harbor, the Kobe Jews were placed in a ghetto in Shanghai, China. 
They remained there until the end of the war. Then most fled to Israel, Canada, or the United States. No one ever went to Curaçao. Nadia Kaplan was able to convince a Russian official to allow her to leave the country. Sali Ganor spent the final days of the war in Dachau. Ironically, he was rescued by Japanese-American soldiers. Chiune Sugihara served admirably in several embassies during the war. From Prague, he was reassigned to Königsberg, Germany, then Bucharest, Romania. But then his story took a dark turn. At the war's end, the Sugihara family had no way to escape back to Japan, and they were captured by the onrushing Soviets. They received no diplomatic immunity and were imprisoned in an internment camp. Their experience could not be compared to the brutal treatment in the Nazi concentration camps, but the family was forced to endure primitive and unhealthy conditions, and many of their belongings were confiscated. Finally, after more than a year in captivity, the family was told they were being shipped home. They made it across Russia, but for months their final passage was delayed until Mrs. Sugihara bartered with a cherished kimono. A Russian guard told us that his wife would like a Japanese kimono and asked if we could give him one. I had kept one kimono and sash that was very expensive, but I gave it to him. The very next day, they told us we could go home. Now, after ten long years, the Sugihara family was returning to a bittersweet reunion with their homeland. Coming back alive from the war, I hear my mother tongue in a low tone all about the homeland harbor. It sounds so sad in my heart. was not as joyful as expected. They had returned to a bombed out wasteland. Then in April of 1947, Tune reported to the foreign ministry, hoping to continue his career. They asked him to stand by for reassignment. After three months, he received a letter from the foreign ministry asking him to come to the office. When he returned, he looked so disappointed. I asked him what was the matter. He said they wanted him to resign from the foreign ministry. They told him, you know the reason, don't you? So we assumed it was because he issued those visas. I still can remember his face. He was speechless when he came back. We understood right away that, you know, it was not a good news. He was so discouraged that I think he didn't want to talk, not even mention about the subject. Even the next day, for a week or months, he didn't say anything. The Japanese government always maintained that the resignation was prompted by the necessary downsizing of the diplomatic corps in the occupied country. But the Sugihara family believes there was additional punishment. Usually when you leave the office in a good way, that they, they give you certain recommendation to work for different Japanese big corporation when you apply for something, they will give you a recommendation. But he could not receive any, any recommendation, or they didn't even ask him 
to take a recommendation letter or something. Uh, he's not the person who will ask more because he, he, he understands that they will not do that. Chione was devastated by the dismissal. And at 47 years old, he was left without a career. Just months later, his seven-year-old son, Haruki, died suddenly. Our youngest was still a first grader. He was just seven years old. In the war, we'd had so many difficulties until we got back to Japan. We were eating horrible food. I think he was weakened during the travel. I feel so much sadness and regret. The family struggled emotionally and financially. Sugihara was forced to take a series of menial jobs. He started working in a supermarket, working in a small shop like I remember. And uh, he, he took any job just to support the family. By strange coincidence, Leo Hannon and Sugihara worked in the same clothing store in Tokyo a shop owned by Anatol Ponve, the leader of the Jewish Rescue Committee in Kobe. Like most of the Jews involved in this story, Hannon never knew the name of the heroic diplomat in Kaunas. He was excited to learn that his co-worker was that man. But Sugihara refused to discuss the incident. I was uh, very curious to find out who that man was and mainly why he was doing it. I didn't have a chance. They wouldn't let me. In 1960, Sugihara took a position with a trading company in Moscow, making use of his fluency in Russian. He worked for 16 years in Moscow, but his family remained in Japan. His life in Russia was a long way from the prestigious embassy position he had always dreamed of. I remember once I stopped in Moscow to visit him, and uh, he was staying in a hotel. He had one room, and he said he would invite me for dinner. So I thought, oh, it must be nice dinner. But he, he said he is going to cook. He took me to the supermarket in Moscow, and he bought uh, some potato and uh, sausage. And he cooked in his toilet. He has a small electric cooking uh, plate. And that was his uh, dinner. I mean, it was something special for him. During this time, several Sugihara survivors searched for him, hoping to thank the man. But he could not be traced. The government claimed they had no information. Also, he was now using the name Sempo Sugiwara, perhaps fearing the Russians would still remember his negotiations so long ago in Manchuria. But at last, in 1968, visa recipient Joshua Nishri, now an Israeli diplomat, found Sugihara. <laughs> We never knew whether the Jewish people were actually saved and were able to go through Japan to freedom. When Mr. Nishri came, we found out for the first time. My husband was so glad to hear that. He felt relieved. He said what he did wasn't in vain. The survivors wanted to honor Chiyune, but he resisted the accolades. The only thing he accepted was a college scholarship to an Israeli university for his son, Nobuki. So why did Sugihara write the visas and ask for nothing in return? Certainly his upbringing and his international lifestyle helped shape his decision. One provocative but unproven theory links Sugihara with the architects of the plan to import Jewish refugees to Manchuria. 
However, in a rare television interview, Sugihara denied knowing of the plan. No, I did not know it then, although someone may have connected me to it later. If I had known about such a plan, it would definitely have made issuing the visas a much easier thing to do, because then I would not have to have taken on the sole burden of responsibility for the act. Rabbi Marvin Tokayer was the leader of the Jewish community in Tokyo in the 1960s and 70s. For four years, he requested a meeting with Sugihara. Finally, Chiyune agreed to the interview, and Tokayer asked him, why? So when I asked him, why did you do it? He did not understand the question. It made no sense to him. So I'm a simple person. Someone says to do a favor or you have an opportunity to help someone in your lifetime. Do it. And he said, in life, do what's right because it's right and leave it alone. No ulterior motive. Do what is right. Don't make money from it. Don't write an article about it. Don't publicize it. Do what's right because it's right. In his final years, Sugihara returned from Moscow and lived simply with his family in the town of Kamakura near Tokyo. For the first time, he had the opportunity to know his grandchildren. But sadly, the years of struggle and pain had changed the man. It was now difficult for them to know the true nature of Chune Sugihara. In my memory, I only remember his face, and he barely smiled. Certainly he must have experienced a lot of difficulties as a diplomat during the war. A person who's been through such adversity and death, he had become quite weakened. Once my grandfather was a big man, but he became smaller and smaller. It was unbearable for me to see. In July of 1986, Chiyune Sugihara passed away. He was 86 years old. I think he hid his kindness in his heart. His face was always stern. He had a very unique sense of humor. We were too small to get it. He would tell strange jokes that I couldn't understand. I used to think he was such a strange old man. He was so bad at expressing his feelings. By the time I found out that he was such a warm-hearted person and I was able to talk to him, he died. I was very sad. I wish I could talk to him more. It's peaceful here. This is the Hill of Humanity, a monument built to pay tribute to Chiyune Sugihara. Hidden high above his hometown of Yaotsu, it was erected in 1992 to honor a national hero. This was a Japanese man who, in the face of one of history's most horrible acts of brutality, chose to act with kindness. Japan, 
Japan inflicted a lot of damage to many countries as a result of getting involved in World War II. When a new constitution was written and war was denounced, it is such a proud thing to know that there was someone like Mr. Sugihara in those days. Chune Sugihara is survived by his wife, three children, and their families. But of course, his legacy extends far beyond his relatives. Today in Kaunas, Lithuania, the Jewish population numbers only about a thousand. But a street is named in Sugihara's honor. In Israel, a small memorial stands in a cedar grove planted in Sugihara's name. Nearby, the Mir Yeshiva flourishes, having relocated there after their stay in Shanghai. Many Sugihara survivors reside in Israel. In 1998, they had a chance to honor Mrs. Sugihara in an emotional reunion at the yeshiva. I am crying. There's no thank you. Mrs. Ambassador, do you think, do you know who thanks you? My mother. My mommy, my daddy, they know what you did. My mommy thanks you. Thousands of mothers thank you. But of course, the greatest testament to Chiune Sugihara is expressed most eloquently in the faces of the thousands of survivors and descendants who benefited from his kindness. There's no question that Sugihara was the savior of my life and of my family, of my children. When I arrived in the United States, I was alone. I got married, so we're two of us. I have five children, all of them married, another 10, so we're 12 of us. And thank God, we have 25 grandchildren. So we are right now 37 descendants alive today as a consequence of one visa that Mr. Sugahari gave. Against his own government, he gave the visas and he paid the price for it. He was a messenger sent by God, right? No doubt. And uh, what I am seeing of myself, thousands of others can see of themselves. Without that visa, they would not have made it. Because of him, there are now 40,000 Jewish people were alive. I mean, like my children, I have eight grandchildren, I have three children. The most important part is that one man can make a difference.